good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm not so used to be doing talks, so sorry if I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> um, but I'm Sophie, and I'm a filmmaker and a, and a writer. Uh, I recently released my uh, short film called Wait. It would premiere it in, in Leuven at the Short Film Festival. And I wrote a, a novel, and the title in English is called All, All Those Days That I've Passed. Um, and I'm also part of the Wanda Collective, which is a collective of filmmakers who fight for the rights of underrepresented groups within the film sector. Or, well, they, they, uh, yeah, no, sorry, that's it. <laughs> um, so, and then I uh, asked me, they asked me to do this talk because uh, this is the Pink's Festival and I'm queer and I'm trans, so I guess I was the right fit. <laughs> Um, and when I first heard that the talk was going to be about, uh, or, or the theme was going to be monumental, the first thing that came up in my mind is like a hot topic right now is the representation of trans people by cis actors. And it's been tended to be awarded with like uh, Academy Awards all the time. And it's, I think it's a discussion maybe we all know about. Um, and then I was going to do like a whole angry talk about how problematic the trans representation was. But then again, I'm no media historian and there's also a great documentary on trans representation called uh, Disclosure and it's on Netflix and they can do it way better than I can. And I more wanted to talk from a personal standpoint and kind of discover together uh, what we can understand with uh, the word trans and think a little bit further than only trans as a body. Um, so I'm going to do like a little uh, personal manifesto of films that have meant a lot to me. Um, I'm going to talk first about a movie, uh, the one of the first like art movies I saw in my life. Um, and yeah, let's first watch the clip. Uh, yeah, so that was a movie, uh, a cli uh, some clips from the movie Boys Don't Cry. I don't, I don't know if you know the movie. I think it's pretty well known. And around when I was 12 or 13, I started moving away from movies like uh, Freaky Friday and She's All That. And I discovered like more art films. And this was one of the films that I saw as the first film. Um, and I, uh, when I got into movies, I really got into movies and I like I read about the Oscars all year and I read about the predictions and I stayed up all night to watch the Oscars and go to like to school with no sleep and I cried if the movie didn't win that I, I wanted to win and this was like one uh, movie that was uh, Hilary Swank got the act, um, award for best actress. Um, and then when I moved away from like mainstream movies to art movies, I also discovered like films with um, yeah lesbian themes in it, like Gia or you had a couple of other movies here. And uh, I watched these films like obsessively over and over again without realizing that I might be gay. Um, and I put it away as being like super interested in this topic only. Um, and so uh, when I watched this movie, like even more explosions happened inside of my head because uh, first of all, I never heard of gay or trans and um, even trans was for me, like I had a very stereotypical view of what it was. And this is also a very stereotypical, like a problematic depiction of what being trans was, but I just knew as trans, like cross dressers and stuff. Um, and when I saw this, the, like I, I thought I, I was going to faint. I wanted to be Brandon, the, the main character, the, who's played by Hilary Swank. Uh, I was in love with him. I was also in love with Chloe Savigny, the, the girl that he's in love with. And I wanted this impossible love. Uh, I felt their love. And I watched this movie like over and over and over again, like a, a teenage boy watching like a porn movie in secret. And I watched all the sex scenes like 10,000 times. Um, and I remember thinking at the time also being so relieved for Hilary Swank that she got to be back, got to go back to normal after doing this role. And I was really concerned that this was like a super hard thing for her to play, to play a trans person. Um, and that she really deserved an Oscar for like putting herself out there to do that. So 
it's pretty sad to think about it that I was like a transphobe even when I'm trans now and uh, yeah also pretty gay phobic or homophobic as a teenager and I think if you watch these kinds of movies and trans people and gay people get killed all the time and the love is impossible it's not so difficult to think about that you kind of uh, get this self-hate hatred because this is what the media tells you over and over again um, so um, one second sorry. Um, yeah, so that's just kind of to sketch how I was like the first contact that I had with with the representation of trans, and I, I've been out as 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 gay since I was uh, since like twelve years or something. I only recently got out as trans, and I think the announcement of this talk was like the biggest coming out I've done. Um, and people who don't know me or who only know me a little bit, they they are confused when I tell them that I'm trans and. I got the question, so were you a boy and are you now a girl or are you a girl who's actually a boy? So, and they're just really concerned with my body parts. And uh, when I tell them, no, I'm not either of those, like I'm trans or non-binary, which is not even a, ter a term I used for people to make it easier for them, but not especially for me. Um, and 10 years ago would have horrified me if they would be confused about my gender, but now I'm actually, I, I like it when they're confused. Um, and that they start thinking that just by my presence alone, they start thinking outside of the box. And I, I was thinking about it that, yeah, again, like I am a man, I'm a woman, I'm trans, I'm non-binary. And I started thinking about being trans as a verb, like I, I am, I trans, I transgress, I trans, I transverse borders, I transverse into a known. So uh, I wanted to talk about a little bit about what it means to be trans, just m more than just my body parts. Um, and um, kind of connect these films that trans, trans, for, transgress borders for me that were first set for me and then widened. Um, and funnily enough, almost all these movies are about an impossible love. Um, but first I'm going to talk about uh, a really big cliche. Um, oops, two. Yeah. The Matrix. We all know the movie. I don't have to uh, summarize it. Um, so we all know the question, do you want to take the red or the blue pill? And it's like become a parable appropriated by, I think, even like the extreme right. And also it's like a really alive uh, metaphor inside the trans community. Um, and I think we're the right ones to, t to take up the story because the Wachowski sisters came out as, as trans as well. Um, and if you have a trans reading of the film is that the blue pill, if you keep taking the blue pill, you keep thinking like things are set in stone, that you're a man, you're a woman, or either you're, you're trans and there's something wrong in your head and it can be fixed medically and your body can be transformed. Uh, and there's nothing in between. Everything is set and it's not in movement. Um, so and when Neo takes the red pill and uh, he like they, he comes into the, this world and everybody's like this kind of gray genderless uh, be, be form of being and they load into this computer program called the construct. Gender is a construct, um, and basically they the f f when when you take the red pill the feet uh, the ground falls away under your feet but you can be basically anything you want. You, 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 if you take the red pill, you, you can be a shapeshifter. Uh, so I think the Matrix made like a nice blueprint to think about gender more than just like you're this, you're that, you're that, and how it can be in movement. Uh, yeah, um, now I'm gonna make a really big jump to another film, but more in the theme of how, how uh, because, um, yeah, how movies can transgress something or can open up something new in your mind. So I'm going to uh, show you a scene from the film that made me want to be a filmmaker. 
uh, that is the movie called In the Mood for Love, and it's about uh, these two people, and they live in the same this in the same house. They rent a room there with their partner, and they grow close to each other when they find out that their their partners are sleeping with each other. Um, and I only learned later that this actually Sofia Coppola was uh, for Lost in Translation was inspired by this film, but it kind of has the same themes, and this is even people who go bent under like society's norms in Hong Kong in the 60s at this time and about like they don't speak a lot and they're very closed off and not in connection with with the with their surroundings or with themselves um, and yeah they, they kind of go bent under the chains that they've put on themselves and the chains that society put on them but the most thing that, that was so beautiful in this film is that it made me realize that film is also something you, you feel with your heart and with your body like this movie is so much about like this repetitive song that comes in and the color and the stolen glances the most meaning is in the glances and not in, in the words that they say um, and yeah, yeah, so to experience something with your body is, I, I guess, it was also a new way of looking to the world for me. Um, and now all this, these stories about an impossible love kind of come to a conclusion into the next scene I'm, I'm going to see, uh, I'm going to show. Um, I think most people know this movie, I don't have to really summarize it, um, but I think for the people who watch it, maybe they can identify with this feeling of watching a queer movie made by queer people. And it kind of gives this like euphoric experience to watch a movie about, about queer love that's not exploitative in any way at all. And I think that's really due to being, a, being made by a queer team, like uh, the, the actresses are queer themselves and Celine Siama is too. And they really think about it, what, the politics of making a queer movie to um, and so to talk about all the time these impossible love movies that I've sh shown you until now Celine Siama always talks in her interviews about that she wanted to make a film about love or lesbian love that is possible and for a filmmaker you hear all the time uh, through like funding bodies or to art school or film school that um, the audience should be on the edge of their seat all the time and they should have the equal amounts of hope and fear will they or won't they making you forcing you into a story like the the, the almost forcing you into a story of like a, a tragic love story either it's possible or impossible um, and there's nothing in between. Um, but this film is, you know that, this, that their love is not really possible because of the time that they're living in, but it's so great to see a movie that's almost without conflict. And we are always tell, told to make movies about conflict, that conflict is the driving force of, of a movie and nothing, nothing, everything else you do is an annoying art movie. But I think this showed like, the opposite because it's so beautiful to just watch uh, a love coming into being and like refusing to be tragedy porn like boys and cry is like it's totally tragic um, so this was a really refreshing take for me as an as a filmmaker to not always think about oh yeah but i should make things more and more shitty for my characters uh, but it can also you can also be love your characters and not like pull them down all the time. Um, and besides that, I think this scene is also a really great, like the matrix was a nice blueprint to think about what it means being trans. I think this is a nice blueprint for what it means to be an artist. Um, you've always had the muse and the artist and the muse is the object and static and sits still and is kind of this tragic character usually when it comes to film or, or novels. Um, but here it's in the movie it's being explored what happens like on, a, in, on the level of the story but also on a meta level what happens when the subject looks back when the artist is just as fragile as, as the one who the story is about and the question all the time who is telling this story and why am I telling 
the story and what is art when there's consent from both sides, from not only the artist's side who forces his worldview upon whatever story he's telling, but when it's what happens when art or movies becomes a collaborative process. Um, so yeah, I think it raises a lot of interesting questions in about like the uh, the all-knowing artist. I think it kind of de deconstructs it, and it's like the, the last scene I wanted to give to you uh, to think about what it means, for, what love means, and what making art means.